Welcome to Ask a CEO Show. It's a show that follows the journey of leaders and executives and tries to uh, give us some insight into what their days are like as an executive, as a leader. Anybody on Long Island knows today's guest. It's Martin Cantor. He's the economist extraordinaire. He's a TV personality. Uh, he's a source to media for anything number oriented. And that's a good thing because I don't understand numbers. And he's just well known for his expertise. Martin's held many, many important influential and foundational appointments and positions that have affected the economic conditions on our region. He's a regular on-air and print contributor to TV and newspapers. He's held director of board positions at colleges and universities, a consulting economist to public officials, towns, villages, and county administrations. He's widely published. He's an author of Long Island, the Global Economy and Race, The Aging of America's First Suburb. He's an invited speaker and lecturer. His white papers have been presented at Harvard University, and most recently he's been inducted into the Long Island Business Hall of Fame. Welcome to the show, Mark. I'm glad to be here. This is very different, because we've been traveling in the same, same circles for many, many years, and I don't think we've actually sat down together to have a conversation. Actually, uh, if it wasn't for LinkedIn, I probably, probably would not have ever known you. It, that, okay, thank you, LinkedIn. <laughs> there you go. I mean, that, you know, people say Long Island is a very, very small community, but it's a very large island. And uh, you, you know you tend to bump into the same people all the time, but it's it's nice to meet new friends all the. You know. This show has allowed me to do that to meet yeah. many people that I've known but have never sat down and have a conversation yeah. with. So this is a really wonderful thing for me, and uh, I don't know if my people like that I do it or don't do it, but I really don't care because I enjoy it. Well, you're the boss; you can do what you like. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they give me a lot of pushback though. <laughs> so in prepping for the show, I read your bio. What a document! Oh my God. It's just too much for me to talk about, but it was so many solid, impressive, impressive accomplishments. No fluff, just real, real economic knowledge. And, and it just, you've had quite an experience. But how'd you get there? What was your backstory? Where did you grow up? How, what schools did you go to? How did you wind up going to be, become an economist? Well, I grew up in Brooklyn and, uh, and uh, my, uh, my father was the first person in his family who uh, went to college. And it took him 10 years at City College, and he be became an accountant. And he worked really hard. And I swore I'd never be an accountant, because he worked really, really hard. Uh, and then I uh, went to Brooklyn College, and my first love was, uh, was history. But you, you can't make enough money in history to raise a family and buy a house. And my second love was psychology. And uh, that entailed taking a doctorate. And I just didn't see myself staying in school that long to get a doctorate. And then uh, I said, well, I might as well be an accountant because everybody needs, needs somebody to tell them how bad they're doing <laughs> or how bankrupt they are. And you can always get a job. And so I did it for practicality. Uh, and when I was doing it, the interesting part of getting a Bachelor of Science in accounting was that uh, it's 60 credits of accounting and economics and only 24 credits were accounting. So the rest was all economics. And I found that I really enjoyed economics. Uh, <laughs> didn't do too well in the class of the coursework, uh, but I loved economics. And uh, that became a cornerstone of, of everything I, I've done um, in my master's work. Right. I focused on uh, socioeconomics uh, because economics is really is the compilation of people's habits. So if you understand how people uh, act, uh, what their backgrounds are, culture matters tremendously in, uh, in sociological backgrounds. And uh, that was my master's. And, uh, and then when I got the opportunity to um, uh, go for a doctorate, uh, uh, you know, it was in education. But the focus on my doctorate was uh, why do some children uh, persevere and why do some children don't and uh, it turns out to be the economics of the community and the school districts and the type of the and the quality of the education so so basically uh, sixty percent of all my coursework was economics Is that right? uh, yep and the, the smallest part was accounting and uh, aren't you lucky because you didn't want to be accountant anyhow. I didn't want to be an accountant but I also had an accountant and, and uh, uh, I used to uh, work in New York City I was a treasurer and chief financial officer of companies and I said, you know, I just don't want to commute to the city anymore. 
Uh, and so I, st I uh, started my own business uh, in the 80s. I, mm -hmm. I bought into uh, uh, an accounting practice and uh, the clients that uh, the former accountant uh, uh, in effect gave me to manage were, were the worst of his lot. They were, they were people who were dying of cancer and the people who were going bankrupt. It was terrible, but I, I, I built it up. And I found that uh, it allowed me the latitude to do what I really love to do, which is, uh, which is government, it's economics, and uh, you know, politics and things like that. And having your own business, you can do it because you only have to answer to yourself. And I, tell everybody, I tell everybody here, I make more mistakes than everybody else, but they're all mine and I keep them secret. <laughs> that's, that's, exa that's exactly right. And that's what I did. You know, because when you work for somebody else and you go out and, and uh, make an appearance and give your opinions, uh, uh, if you give your opinions, you're, you're going to anger, annoy, irk somebody. And uh, I didn't want that to be my boss and my job reliant that, on that. If I say something that somebody is not happy with, that it's just... I take responsibility for it. It's, it, it. it's my statement, and so it makes my life a lot easier. So we talk to leaders about their day-to-day -day challenges, and this is an interesting segue off of that. Your colleagues don't always agree, economists. How come? Erwin Kellner, one of, one of my favorite uh, econo uh, Long Island economists, uh, he used to have a joke. He says, uh, you know, you, you can... Uh, Lay, lay economists uh, end to end, and and they wouldn't agree. And then when they when they, <laughs> when they and then when they finally don't agree, you can still lay them end to end. <laughs> and he says, yeah, you know, you can look at the same data, and uh, and intelligent people can come up with different you know different uh, uh, conclusions, as we're seeing today. Uh, in today's economics, uh, you have one set of data coming out, and uh, the left will say will we'll interpret it one way, the right will interpret it another way. And I interpret it right down the middle. I yeah. always say two and two always equals four. Never three and a half or five, but apparently I'm wrong. No, I, well, uh, the way I do it, it's two and two equals four. Okay. <laughs> the, the, where the left and right do it, it's uh, two and two equals five or three. <laughs> <laughs> Very correct. So many of your colleagues, many of your colleagues are, are either saying we're in a recession or a recession is coming. What's your view? Uh, well, I, I, think, I think we're in a recession, but it's a, it's a jobless loss recession. Only, uh, and I say that uh, uh, because the textbook definition of recession is uh, two consecutive quarters of negative uh, gross domestic product growth. We already had it in the first quarter of this year, uh, slightly, almost minus 1.7, which is not hugely uh, recessionary. And uh, this one will probably be 1.7 as well, 1.8. Uh, that's not bad uh, in terms of uh, negative growth, uh, uh, and that's why you know our, our big problem is inflation, uh, and uh, we have too much money out there. That's really what's causing it. Uh, you know, the, the federal government has written checks uh, uh, to the tune of four four trillion dollars, uh, and that's basically uh, two percent of the gross domestic product. That's a lot of money to be putting out there, and we just have way too much money chasing too few goods. And that's what's causing this recession, or this inflation, and that's what will cause this that recession. That will eventually cause a recession. It has to with the Federal Reserve, because what they have to do uh, is they have to take that $4 trillion out of the money supply. When was our last recession? The last recession was uh, 2007 to 2009, but that was a different kind of recession. Uh, inflation then at the worst was 4.7%. Uh, and that was a small, uh, that was in 2009, nine, we're 9.1 percent right now, and we'll probably go to 9.4 percent inflation. Uh, that was basically a crisis of the banking industry, uh, subprime mortgages, uh, flipping houses, real estate, uh, mortgage-backed securities. Uh, it was the go-go era where people would invest money uh, in mortgage-backed securities because the interest rate was greater. Uh, that was the collapse that caused the recession. What's called uh, uh, the recession at that time? Uh, uh, gross domestic product was 14 trillion, but debt was only 9 trillion. Today, uh, gross domestic product is 21 trillion, but debt is over 30 trillion. So we have a complete <laughs> reversal. So we have way too much money, and uh, and this this inflationary period uh, it was caused by the government printing too much money and not producing enough goods and services. Whereas the recession in 2008 was the opposite. The gross, domestic, uh, the gross national product was doing well, uh, about 14 trillion for uh, a year, and debt was uh, at worst was 11 trillion. 
So we're, we're at a point where we've got way too much money out there. And Us little business owners who've, who've survived 08, 07, 08, 09, plus COVID, have an attitude of, well, we've seen this before. Yeah. Why is this different? Oh, this is way different. Uh, the recession in 2008, 2009 really didn't impact, uh, it impacted small business, but not the way it's impacting now. This recession is permeating the, the entire uh, international economy as well as the U.S. economy. Every sector is impacted. Uh, uh, bread is impacted because of the war in Ukraine. I just that saw that. I just saw that. Wheat is up. That's been around for a long time. Pizza. Pizza now costs, a slice of pizza in New York City costs more, more than subway fare one-way trip, and that was never happening. Uh, it's because of the wheat in Ukraine. Uh, oil, um, uh, the, uh, you know, I have to say it, that this administration has done woefully inadequate, has caused the oil recession. Uh, and uh, right now, we, uh, before uh, th uh, this administration came in, we had 135 refineries operating. Now we only have 128 operating. We had two idle refineries in 2019. We now have seven idle refineries. Refineries are operating right now at 94% capacity. They cannot produce any more. And because of uh, the president's uh, energy policies, and uh, I can't believe he started today doubling down on climate change, uh, when the real issue is that uh, when the president of Chevron says he will not invest a nickel in repairing his refineries, because it takes over 10 years to get back your, your investment in a refinery. When he says, based upon the current policies, he will not invest a nickel in a refinery, that's not good for domestic uh, oil production. Remember, the United States consumes 20 million barrels a day of oil. We used to produce 13 million barrels a day. Now we're producing 11 and a half million barrels. So all those numbers seem fractionally smaller and or bigger but they have a huge impact mm -hmm. one way or the other in the marketplace. I know the refineries are huge. Why would the oil companies invest with such a draconian bullet pointed at them that's the, the White House. And that's the problem. Uh, the Saudi Arabians, uh, what, what they're doing is they used to, they're the, one of the world's largest producers, but because of the, of the pandemic and the, uh, the cutback on use of oil and gasoline, all the oil producing countries, OPEC in particular, uh, they, uh, they lost money. So what they've been doing is, is producing less oil, driving up the market price so they can recoup the money. And, 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 and really, you know, I don't want this to be a beat up on the president thing, but he really bungled the foreign policy with Saudi Arabia and they won't produce an ounce of oil more for this country and, and, uh, and, and, and the current domestic oil policy is that oil companies won't produce more. So what you have right. is you have a, a high demand, and low supply. That's textbook definition of Between prices. a rock and a hard place. Yep, that's prices go up. That's uh, simple economics. Right. So we went a little far out on a tangent there, but that's okay. Yeah. I, want, I really want to talk about you and what you think about. So you're really generous with your time, with your energy, your expertise. What part of your job do you value the most? Uh, uh, well, I enjoy helping people who, you know, who uh, can't get the advice uh, that, to help themselves. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot of people out there are trying to survive. Um, I had a guy, uh, a viewer of the TV show, uh, uh, he was, I think, 78 years old, and he, he writes me, he says, should I buy oil now to fill up my tank for the winter, or should I wait until the fall, you Simple know? question. Yeah, and I said, you know, so I took a look at that time at the oil futures, and the oil futures were the same for November as they are now. And I said, well, here's, you know, pick your poison, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, the oil prices today will probably be the same in the fall. Now, we're seeing the oil prices come down now uh, only because uh, the, for the fear of recession, Oil companies are, are not buying as much oil because they know when a recession comes, oil is, and energy is going to be ah. cut back. So they're buying less, so the demand is less. I was wondering why the prices yeah, were going down. so that's down. why. So the oil companies are saying, hey man, I'm not buying a dollar fifteen a uh, dollar a barrel oil when the demand because of what the Federal Reserve will do to curb inflation will right. drive down the demand for oil. And I'm stuck with 
you know, uh, with a, a dollar fifteen uh, bar a dollar a barrel when the demand will come down and oil will now sell for ninety. So I'm in the hole f for thirty dollars a barrel, and I'm going to lose money. So what they're doing in the future market is saying I'm buying it for what I think it's the, the use will be in the in the fall. So, the, so that's why the oil prices are coming down. Very interesting. It's a short-term thing. It, it, it's going to be a balance, and then we'll come up again. I enjoy being at the School of Cantor. This is really good. It's stuff I have no idea. So anyway, they're telling me I need to take a commercial break. Got to pay so the bills. Stand by. We're going to go off for a little commercial, and then we'll be back with Martin Cantor. We're back with Martin Cantor, economist extraordinaire. It's not every day that a profession gets to an invite to Harvard to present a paper. Tell me about that. Yeah, that was, that was pretty good. I was working, I was working at uh, the uh, Institute for Socioeconomic Studies up in White Plains. Uh, the, the president was Leonard Green, uh, and uh, he was a, he's the one who invented the wind shear detector on the planes. Okay. And uh, he, w he was a very prominent aeronautical uh, 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 experimenter and in innovator. And he, uh, he had a side hobby of economic policy and, and sociological policy. He was a libertarian. And uh, so I got it, uh, he hired me as a senior fellow. And, one, and he was also a benefactor of the uh, Rockland County Community College. So one day, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I was invited there along with Leonard uh, to, uh, to, to see a Harvard professor who had written a book when work, uh, William Julius Wilson, When, when uh, Work Disappears. And he was part of the black intelligentsia at Harvard at that time, Cornell West, and, and, uh, and, and uh, he was, uh, Ju Wilson was an advisor to Bill Clinton. So I said, wow, what an opportunity. So uh, we went there. And uh, for a private luncheon, there was about 12 of us. And uh, I said, no way, I'm not going to sit at the table with this guy. And so we sat and, and we were talking. And I was talking about some of the things that I was doing in the community development in Long Island. And he said to me, he says, you know, uh, my students at Harvard don't know what the real world is like. He says, would you like to uh, come up and, and give a presentation? So I said, sure. Uh, and about a week before I go up there, I called up, is everything okay? And they said, yeah, what's the title of the paper uh, you're going to present? And like my wife said to me, she says, you have no paper. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no paper, you know. And, and so I said, whoa, do I have to? I, so I, I knew uh, what, what, what his philosophy was, you know, uh, in terms of economic policy for poor and minority communities. He felt the, the largest poverty uh, component in the U.S. Uh, economy happened to be poor whites. But the largest compo uh, uh, poverty component of any uh, cultural group are poor blacks. So I wrote, I wrote about his concept, race-neutral, sustainable economic development. And that was my paper. Uh, I wrote it, and I gave it to him. And I will tell you, after I fin concluded my doctorate work, uh, I would have failed my paper. 
it was, it was, it was really, I was embarrassed. I'm embarrassed to show it to yeah, anybody. It really was not, yeah, it really funny. was not a good, a good academic paper, but he was very kind. Uh, and uh, uh, it was very gracious, and, uh, uh, and so I went there, and the beautiful thing about going to Harvard uh, is they pay for everything. I mean, they pay for airfare, they pay for mm -hmm. hotels, I mean, they got an endowment for what, 200 million, mm -hmm. you know, but it was a, it was a great experience. Uh, when I went there, they had, they had handbills on all the kiosks introducing me uh, uh, as, as to, to give uh, a presentation on World race World renowned Martin Cantor will be presenting in yeah, well, that's what they did. I said, wow, you know, I said, that is crazy. And the interesting thing about going to Harvard is that they have a, a big bronze statue of John Harvard. Yes. Uh, and uh, what you're supposed to do is rub his toe of his boot with your hand. And if you do that, then you'll get invited back. Well, that foot is worn. It, it, you, it's no longer the bronze. You Man, can actually see down. the copper. Yeah, right. but I... But I rubbed it. You I know. went to Harvard. I got a T-shirt that says so. <laughs> I went to, <laughs> yeah, so it was a great experience, and and uh, you know, and and the guy who was on the program with me was a nuclear physicist from MIT, and and I'm just saying, whoa, that's pretty rarefied air. <laughs> I said I don't belong in this setting, you know. But it was it was quite an experience, and uh, and that's really uh, uh, when I left there. That's that's what propelled me to go for my master's, because I realized that. Uh, it had been about 30 years since I had graduated college, and I realized how much I didn't know, and I said, got to go back to school. Well, I still know what I don't know, and I don't know it, and it's yeah. a little late now, but so I get pe good oh, people. it's never who too knows, late. To, good people who know stuff around me. That's the important thing, but, you, you know, there's a lot of stuff that you don't know. So I went back to school, and then yeah. after I finished, I went for my doctorate. So I it's know. It's always little, about learning. Have to be, it's always be a life about learning. Yeah. It's always about learning, picking up. That's why I like to go to networking opportunities where there's panel discussions and there's round tables. And Martin uh, Stuart Alma was on just on this morning, and, and his advice to the CEOs was network, right? And I've been in company with him at the Jewish Business Network. And the pre round table before the presentation is so dynamic, it's CEOs around the table just winging it, talking about what their problems are oh, yeah. and what's going on. Last one was about remote workers. Another was about hiring people, how difficult it's become. Another was uh, the supply chain. So you always learn when you're in company of other CEOs, and that's why I love this show, because I'm always learning. I get to watch this in the editing room, and I pick up pearls all the time. So audience, watch, listen, learn. Okay. So your, your job requires big thoughts, thinking about big numbers. What do you do for relaxation? Uh, I know you're a world traveler. Well, uh, what do we do for relaxation? Well, uh, <clears throat> I just I, I connect with an old college buddy of mine, and uh, and I've, I've worked on my golf game and I've raised it from stink to poor, <laughs> and so uh, so uh, I, so I enjoy doing I enjoy doing that. Uh, you know, uh, you have grandchildren enjoy doing that. Uh, uh, you know, traveling is a big thing. Uh, reading, I do a lot of reading, you know, uh, when, when you get through. Uh, uh, I always liked, uh, I just finished a, a book, uh, David Brinkley mm -hmm. and, and uh, uh, Walter Cronkite. I'm finishing that book. So you like biography type books. Uh, I love biography. I, I like things where I can learn what happened because, the, because it gives you a perspective of where you are now. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I read a book, uh, uh, my favorite person of all time is Winston Churchill. Oh. You know, my best. Oh, the my the best. best. And I read Winston Churchill, when, uh, his book, when uh, he assumed the prime ministership of England uh, and, and the beginning of World War II. And, uh, and my second favorite guy is FDR. And I have a book of his uh, during the same time frame. So it's interesting to read from the same set of events that Churchill and FDR had to deal with, how each one viewed the other and how each one viewed the other. And that's why I do it, because when you read that, now, uh, you're always learning something and you're learning perspective. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, why make the, mis the original mistake? You make know, it again. let somebody else make the mistake and learn from it so you succeed. And that's There's always time to do it right the second time. Ab absolutely. <laughs> Right. So, okay. So now our audience, CEOs, people on their journey to C-suite, and I always ask guests to give them your advice, personal, professional, or both. What would you say to CEOs and those on the way to the corner office? You know, uh, I always, I always, I had, I had a friend of mine. This is the advice I got uh, a long time ago. 
uh, I was talking to him uh, about something, and he says to me, he says, you know, Marty, he says, you're starting to believe your own BS. And, uh, and that was the best piece of advice I can give anybody. He says, don't believe don't your believe own hype, and don't believe your own BS. And, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and ego is, and hubris are very dangerous uh, to a career and to success. Uh, and, uh, you know, just stay grounded and realize that, you know, there's a bigger world out there. Interesting word you just used, hubris. I think that's the infection that most of our politicians suffer from. Oh, yeah, they believe their own BS. And, that's, and that's, that is dangerous. On both sides of the aisle. Oh, I mean, uh, yeah. you know, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's damaging to, to uh, the people who put them in office. You know, because you will, you know, and I served uh, as commissioner of economic development and I worked for county execs and, you know, I've done work for senators and congressmen. And, and you know, sometimes these people forget who so they're working for. how do you for. deal with that when you come to them with a set of analysis? And they push back and say, well, I can't be dealing with that. At what point do you just go, okay, fine, I'm done? Is there a point where you come, I can't talk to you anymore? Thank goodness that that's my reputation. So if people want somebody to flim flam with the numbers, uh, they don't come to me. Uh, if they want the truth and they want some real good analysis and they want some real good policy on how to get out of a mess or how to evaluate where they're in, 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 in truthful terms, then I get hired. My business is doing very well, I must add. But uh, the reality is, is that uh, I, won't take, I won't take on an assignment if, uh, if someone's gonna mess around with my conclusions and my numbers. I mean, I'm, I work very well with people and I put it in the format that, uh, you know, I just got finished with this one project uh, and it was an economic impact work and I put, you know, I put the background of the economy where we are in, mm -hmm. And they said to me, you know, he says, this, this is going out to other people, so can we get rid of the discussion on the economy? I said, sure, because if it doesn't fit where the client needs to present the information, then I failed also. But they didn't touch my numbers, and they didn't touch my conclusions. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they, they, just, they just asked if I could, if I could uh, make the environment that the numbers are being presented in different, which is fine. You know, it's, it, it, it's their paper, but, but they don't mess with my numbers. So. I appreciate you being on the show. This is great stuff. Tell the audience how they can reach you for more information about what you do or to hire you or to whatever you'd like to tell the audience. It's yours. Yeah, well, uh, you can reach me from, on my website. It's, it's very simple. It's martincantor.com. And uh, you'll see all the work that I've done uh, and uh, the, the reports I've done. And you'll see some interesting uh, television uh, and, and airings of radio, TV, and print. Mm -hmm. And there might be some information uh, uh, on it that you, that you might be able to use. So uh, that's how you can get to me. Terrific. Thank you so much, Martin. Well, that's a wrap, folks. Ask a CEO with Martin Cantor. Uh, make sure you check us out on gregscorneroffice.com and uh, Greg's Corner Office YouTube channel. Like and subscribe. And... We'll be bringing you more and more Ask a CEO shows with outstanding leaders. So God bless you all and thank you.